so very good. Hey, these are perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. How are you going to say thank you? Thank you. 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 Thank
for running this uh, organization, uh, Indigenous Studies Reading Group, which has been a great inspiration um, for this paper as well, um, and for other things. Um, so this is a working paper, so I, will, I would welcome any comments, especially the title. <laughs> I haven't decided on the title. so. Um, and I would love to ha uh, get your feedback on um, uh, the various ideas that I that I try to map on here in the paper. Um, so I would like to begin with uh, this poem uh, written by an unknown author. Some say that it's written by a child um, somewhere in Africa. Um, I read this poem in, um, in, when I was in Korea in 2006, and this was something that really made me think about the term people of color and also the term color. When I born, I black. When I grow up, I black. When I go in sun, I black. When I scared, I black. When I sick, I black. And when I die, in still, I still black. And you white people, when you born, you pink. When you grow up, you white. When you grow, go in, in sun, you red. When you cold, you blue. When you scared, you yellow. When you sick, you green. And when you die, you gray. And you calling me color. So it shows how arbitrary the term colored is um, and what it means to be colored um, and what it means to be cold colored. So I wanted to um, begin with that um, idea of color in the people of color. Um, and I'll read my paper. There are four sections um, here, and I will um, stop and talk uh, here and there. Born and raised in Korea, I never considered myself a person of color before I moved to the United States. As a recent immigrant, the first challenge was to accept that I am a person of color. In fact, there is no other possibility for me but to be a person of color, a woman of color. Realizing the racial meaning of one's own body as an adult is a debilitating experience since it requires a radical, profound revision in the ways in which one constitutes her identity. For a long time, I was reluctant to accept this part of my new identity or to allow it any determining power. Since I wanted to be a scholar, a philosopher among other scholars, not a woman of color scholar or even a woman scholar. As many do, I thought denial would take the power away from it. Um, but when I realized my denial wasn't going to open up any more possibilities, I began articulating myself as a racialized uh, subject. Um, but as, a, as, I about to, as I was about to do that, I faced another challenge. I was told that Asians or Asian Americans are not really people of color. I'll go back to this point uh, later in the paper. Um, naturally, questions occurred. Who are the people or peoples when we say people of color? What does it mean to identify oneself as a person of color in the United States? If the line between colored and non-colored uh, is arbitrarily drawn by the whites, as, um, as the above poem points out, is it any problematic to ex adopt a term to describe racialized people? In the United States, uh, various terms have been used to des designate those who are not white. Colored people, people of color, members of minority, racial and ethnic minorities, etc. The term people of color originated from the French phrase Jean de couleur libre, uh, which indicated a meaning people of, uh, free people of color which indicated three people of mixed race in France, uh, French West uh, Indian colonies. The term free people of color was used to describe non-white people's experience after the abolition of uh, slavery. 
along with the more uh, derogatory, term, de derogatory uh, terms such as Negroes or colored, uh, the term free people of color was initially used to designate black people in the United States. Then it evolved to be a more general, neutral term that embraces various forms of uh, racialization process. As Vidal Ortiz uh, points out, one of the developments of the term people of color is precisely its flexibility in accommodating various groups, similarly disadvantaged, even if their disadvantages are based on different variables. This flexibility of the term, however, comes with certain limitations. As its strength uh, lies in the unity of the people as a general category, it highlights the supposed commonality among the people, the shared experience of systemic racism, rather than the specificities of uh, racialization experienced by different peoples of color. So Manny Marable writes, quote, many uh, advocates of Diversity and the study of racialized ethnicities tend to homogenize groups uh, into the broad political construct known as people of color. The concept people of color has tremendous utility in bringing people t uh, toward a comparative historical awareness about the commonalities of oppression and resistance that racialized ethnic groups have experienced. Our voices and visions cannot properly be un undressed or interpreted in isolation from one another. But to argue that all people of color are therefore equally oppressed and share the objective basis um, for a common politics is dubious at best. End of quote. Um, as Mirabal notes, questions have been raised regarding the problem of homogenization that the notion suggests. Lumping all non-white peoples together risks, uh, risks uh, ne neglecting historical specificities that form the ground of various forms of racism and prioritizing the experience of certain racial groups to others. For example, Linda Al Martin Al Alcoff shows uh, how the black-white binary in racial discourse fails to recognize the differential racialization uh, racial processes of uh, Asian Americans and Latino Latina Americans and thus creates conflicts within communities of color. Most, more recently, Jared Sexton claimed that there is a form of color blindness um, inherent to the concept of people of color that insists upon the monolithic character of victimization under white supremacy, which fails to understand the specificity of uh, anti-blackness. I am sympathetic to the idea that recognizing the differences between racial groups is critical for coalition building. I'd like to ask further, however, by whom, for what purpose, these differences are to be recognized. Since the ways in which racial differences are understood um, rely largely on their proximity to whiteness. The techniques of white normativity have become so adaptable that it embraces diversity as it institutes hierarchy at the same time. It promotes particular forms of assimilation, the non-threatening, subservient kind. When racial differences are understood in terms of their proximity to whiteness, uh, that is, when peoples of color are hierarchized according to the degree to which one is regarded as colored or to the degree to which one is white identified, the notion of people uh, of color would remain reactionary. The people as a collective political subject would not hold when it reproduces the logic of racial domination and alienation that it uses. In this paper, I, I prob problematize the notion of people of color as it is used in racial discourse in the United States. I consider the strategic importance of the term for um, coalition building as well as possible hesitancy and reluctance toward such characterization. I discuss how the term could be, be uh, could become a merely neg negative de delimitation when white normativity, white normativity, uh, as as the organizing principle of the people is reproduced within communities of color as a hierarchizing principle. I claim that in order to abolish this um, conceptual dependency of um, upon whiteness, the notion of people of color should be construed in affirmative terms that point beyond their negative oppositional identity as non-white. 
So it is my contention that the notion is best understood through its uh, implied absence, absence of belongingness, absence of self-determination. Thus I explore the idea of belonging as a temporal e experience and show in which sense people of color do not belong in the present. Using uh, Franz Fanon's description of racial identification process as arriving too late in the world. Then I turn to Deleuze's concept of a people to come to articulate what this absence of people entails. And I conclude by argue, arguing that the notion of people of color understood as a people to come is an assertion of the right to belong and a call for a new form of subjectivity. We could kind of end there, but <laughs> 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 that's the outline of the paper. Um, so the first section is um, the notion of people of color. So here I examine the idea of externality, how um, People of color is uh, negative, negative identity uh, by delimited uh, as negative delimitation as non white So, for Jean Jacques Rousseau, the notion of people as popular sovereignty is based on the idea that the authority of a state comes from the consent of the people. The legitimacy of sovereignty is derived from the imminence of power distribution. Quote, thus before examining the act whereby a people chooses a king, it would be well to examine the act whereby a people is a people. For, it, for since this act is necessarily prior to the other, it is the true foundation of society. End quote. In Rousseau, a people constitute themselves as a sovereign through the imminent rearrangement of forces rather than giving the power to someone external to them. The people only contract with itself. But there is a fundamental tension inherent to the constitution of people as a uh, collective subject. The recipient of the contract does not pre-exist as a second party of the contract, but is resulted as a product of the act. That is, a people becomes a people by the act, by the very act that it is a people. This means that there exists no imminent characteristics that make the people as one indiv indivisible whole prior to its construction. As uh, Kevin Olson writes, the power of the people is imagined as a normative construction, as having an inherent value, uh, natural rectitude, or obligatory force. Attempts to settle the meaning and composition of the people are also attempts to attach normative connotations to them. The supposed identi uh, unity of the people is what gives the people power, which is also what gives the term people of color strategic uh, utility. When we consider um, actual groups of people as a political construct, um, they are often defined negatively. A people is organized against what it is not, whether it is a state, class, or a race. What makes a people people lies external to them. Oftentimes what it resists is what binds the people together. As uh, Kirari argues, it is when an exterior to the people, potentially hostile to the people, becomes apparent that uh, the constitution of a people is mobilized. In this sense, externality is the condition for possible emergence of the unity of, uh, of the entity of, of people. The idea of people in people of color can also be examined in this way. It is by negative delimitation as non-whites that people of color become the people. There is nothing intrinsic to the people that bring them together. The category makes sense only in reference to whiteness. Um, moreover, the, not, only the, not only what mo mobilizes the people, but also determination of the people itself, the color, as I mentioned earlier, is external to the people. Uh, that is, those who are never in contact with whiteness, hypothetically, would ne neither identify themselves as a person of color nor constitute themselves as a people. What is the significance of this um, externality? 
First, in relation to the white, uh, the externality seems to introduce an oppositional structure that identifies whiteness as the organizing princi principle for people of color. In fact, the category people of color only marks, only marks the limit um, of racial privilege drawn by whites themselves. It makes white whiteness visible to those who own it. It makes evident the fact that racializer racialization of the people is a product of white domination as well as a necessary element in producing white subjectivity. The, the organization of people of color does not aim to establish the oppositional structure but to dismantle it so that racial difference would be understood as constitutive of any subjectivity. Second, for people of color themselves, the externality concerns the question of racial identity. The notion person of color as an imposed uh, identity or a negative de delineation does not provide an affirmative formulation of identity beyond the acknowledgement of racial hierarchy. Identifying oneself as a person of color is a positioning of subjectivity in relation to the white, necessitated by white normativity, um, but not a submission to racial ascriptions as external determinations. However, not being able to define oneself on their own term and constantly having to situate oneself in relation to the white could make them vulnerable to pressure to assimilate. Lastly, and related to the um, externality of racial determinations and its implied lack of affirmative identity can result in inter-ethnic tensions um, between different peoples of color. As mentioned earlier, um, when white normativity um, as the external uniting principle of the people is internalized, people of color conceive themselves and each other uh, according to their proximity to white. The people as a collective subjectivity cannot be held once the relation among the peoples can repro uh, only reproduces the racial hierarchy they try to resist. The aim of um, racial struggle is not to obtain the power of dominance, but to reclaim the right to self-determination. In this regard, the process of Asian and Asian American racialization is worth noting. It, uh, it is said that Asian Americans and immigrants from Asia have become basically white, and that they are a model minority uh, well assimilated to the white culture. In her article on the in invisibility problem of Asian Americans, Yoko Arisaka discusses how assimilation requires a rejection of their own identity, not only as Asian, but also as a person of color. Thus, successfully, uh, successfully assimilated Asians are in, invisible as a group, both in the dominant culture and in the racial minority culture. In fact, from the point of view, uh, from their point of view, becoming invisible is not a problem, but a sign of success. She, uh, Arisaka continues to point out that the rejection of racial identity could contribute to the interracial tensions within communities of color. According to Arisaka, quote, it is not unusual to see such assimilated Asians developing racism against blacks and Hispanics, adopting exactly the racism prevalent in white middle uh, class culture. The irony of course is that they are often targets of such racism themselves, yet they continue to think, think of themselves as being lucky that they are still more white than the other groups. What Arisaka calls uh, the assimilationist ideology of white identification is a particular expression of the external determinations as internalized. Assimilation is often considered as a process of de-racialization since white normativity um, presents itself in uh, non-racial terms. But assimilation is ultimately white identification and the attempt to conform, assimilate, de-racialize takes the effacement of one's non-white self. Having rejected one's racial identity as a person of color uh, and being rejected, rejected by whites, one could easily be placed in the in-between state as non-white and non-colored. 
the assimilationist uh, ideology perpetuates itself through this identity crisis that makes non-white subjects more precarious and thus more susceptible to internalizing racial identifications ascribed by the white, such as model minority myth. On the collective level, the assimilationist ideology uh, is sustained by a hierarchy between peoples of color that reinforces the normalization of whiteness. In short, what is most alarming about the externality of, in the constitution of people of color as co collective subjectivity is uh, that it lacks self-determination and affirmative identity. Given its oppositional nature, the strength of the notion people of color lies in its critical power rather than a creative one. The people lacking the power to self-determination calls for a new form of subjectivity. So the following questions arise. How can the people of color organize themselves without reproducing the oppressive logic of white supremacy within communities of color themselves? How do we understand racial differences without hierarchy? archizing them in relation to the white. How can a person of color position herself without submitting either to the inferior, inferior submissive position ascribed to them or to assimilate, assimilationist ideology? In order to avoid the confusions and problems arising from the negative uh, and potentially reactive nature of the term, while uh, preserving its power to form coalition, I propose that we conceive the notion of people of color in affirmative terms that point beyond their opposition, uh, thus in subordination to the white. I realize the great importance of the concepts that describe the subordinate position ascribed to non-white racial groups, such as discrimination uh, or oppression. However, I believe it would be appropriate to reconceptualize these ideas in terms of white supremacy or white privilege which locate the origin of the problem more accurately and more explicitly. I claim that the notion of people uh, in people of color is best understood in uh, its implied absence, uh, the absence of self-determination and that of belongingness. In what follows, I articulate the idea of absence as a way in which people of color situate themselves or fail to do so in the world. I draw on uh, Fanon's description of arriving too late in the world and uh, show how the temporal structure of racialization renders people of color absent in the present. So uh, next section is on the absence and um, in Fanon, and this is where it gets more philosophical. <laughs> um, so Fanon's phenomenological analysis of the formation of the racialized subject begins with a troubled relation between one's black body and the world. In the white world, the man of color encounters difficulties in development of his um, bodily schema. There was a quote. Bodily schema concerns a uh, structuring of the self as a body in the spati spatial and temporal world. When confronted with the collective white gaze expressed as the white boy's outcry, look, a Negro, Fanon discovers the meanings attached to his black body beyond his, its um, corporeality. His temporal account of racialization processes, despite its gravity, extremely illuminating. And this is the quote number two on the handout. Too late. Everything had been predicted, discovered, proved, and exploited. My shaky hands grasped at nothing. The resources had been exhausted, too late. But there again, I want to understand. Ever since someone complained that he had arrived too late and everything had already been said, there seems to be nostalgia for the past. In reply, a person says, you have come too late much too late. There will always be a world, a white world, between you and us. That impossibility on either side to obliterate the past once and for all. Understandably, um, Fanon does not uh, elaborate much here, but the sense of belatedness in his arrival in the world seems to express a painful recognition of certain impossibility. The impossibility to resist, 
get past or overturn the imposed meanings of his blackness. As he writes, um, quote, the evidence is there, unalterable. My blackness is, was there, dark, unarguable. It tormented me, pursued me, disturbed me, and angered me, end of quote. Fanon describes this feeling of powerlessness as an over-determination. The relationship of his body to the world is not only defined by bodily schema, but also historical and racial schema that throws him back in the place of his ancestors who were enslaved and colonized. Accordingly, he's, he's not invited to constitute the world, but is interpolated to reconstitute himself as a racialized subject in accordance with the external determinations or over-determinations. I believe this failure of bodily schema in racial interpola interpolation has an ontolo ontological implication, what we might call temporal dissonance, that disrupts one's alignment with the world. As stated above, uh, the unfamiliar weight, unfam unfamiliar weight or the burden of corporeal malediction that is placed on his body is derived from the impossibility to obliterate the past. The feeling of too lateness arises from the irreversibility of the colonial history and the continuous domination of this past over his racialized body and the present. Unable to assert one's being apart from his, uh, the irrevocable past, he cannot advance in time. He no longer belongs to the present. In George Yancey's words, the Negro has always has always already done something wrong by virtue of being a Negro. The meaning of the black body is always already there, and one can never arrive soon enough to speak for themselves. The temporal aspect of racialization is crucial um, since it is a fundamental impediment to the condition of resistance. For Fanon, resistance is based on the possibility of recognition, and since racialized black subjectivity is grounded in the past, there is little chance for recognition. Um, the, he says, the black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white men. And this failure of recognition, what occupies the present is whiteness as a norm and the projections of white ideas about what blacks are supposed to be. Whiteness as the present state of race leaves a person of color with two options, either conforming to their expectations about people of color or assimilating to the white space, none of which gives you the right to belong. Um, if the two lateness concerns the overdetermination by the past and the impossibility to belong in the present, it necessarily relates, strangely enough, to the sense of arriving too early. The absence in the present could imply no longer or not yet, and in this case, it is both. Fanon writes in the introduction, don't expect to see me uh, see any explosion today. It is too early or too late. I take being too early to mean a sense of rejected future. For a black person, uh, the possibilities of seeing oneself otherwise are not yet actualized. There is no alternative future in the horizon. According to Fanon, the only possible future is to be or become white. Quote, as painful as it is for us to have to say this, there is but one destiny for the black men, and it is white, end of quote. As Didier Fassan puts it, uh, racial ascription is not only an imposition of an identity, but also a deprivation of possible alternative identifications. Since the condition of recognition in the present lies in whiteness, uh, the projected future does not promise any other possibilities. What Fanon describes is uh, the racialization of the people of African descent. However, I believe the temporal dissonance we observe, observe in the form of arriving in the world too late and too early describes people of color's experience in general of the discovery of their race confronted with the white gaze. As long as they are overdetermined by their colors, the people do not belong in the present. 
In racial ascription, one's being is not open for determinations. It is whiteness as a habit and a determining power of leaving political and perceptive possibilities that occupies the present state of race. In the following, I develop further how to affirm the present absence of the people by imagining future uh, that is not bound by whiteness as the now. So here we go. I'll give you more hope. <laughs> Uh, people of color as a people yet to come. We have examined um, the notion of people of color in terms of externality, the lack of self-determination and its absence in the presence, present. In what follows, I propose that we conceive the people in people of color as a people to come in uh, Deleuze's term, which appreciates the being of the people who cannot be accounted for in the dominant language. Deleuze introduces the, the concept of people, of, uh, people to come in his second book on cinema, in his discussion of the difference between classical and modern political cinema. According to him, uh, in classical cinema, the people are there, even though they are oppressed, tricked, subject, uh, subject even though blind or conscious. In modern political cinema, however, the people are no longer represented as united collective political subjects. Deleuze writes, uh, quote, Rene and the Straps are the greatest political filmmakers in the West in modern cinema. But oddly, this is not through the presence of people. On the contrary, it is because they know how to show how the people are what is missing, what is not there. If there were a modern political cinema, it would be on this basis. The people no, no longer exist, or not yet. The people are missing. Deleuze notes that this absence is obvious in the third world, where the oppressed and exploited nations that go through a collective identity crisis resulted from being in a uh, state of perpetual minorities. But the absence of people does not mean a renunciation of cinema as political art, but a new basis on which modern political cinema is founded. This absence also informs a necessary change in the forms of struggle. So this is quote number three on, on the handout. If, people, if the people are missing, if there is no longer consciousness, evolution, or revolution, it is a scheme of reversal which itself becomes impossible. There will no longer be conquest of power by a proletariat or by a united or unified people. The death knell uh, for becoming conscious was precisely the consciousness that there were no people, but always several peoples, an infinity of peoples, which remain to be united or should not be united, uh, in order for the problem of change. It is in this way that third world cinema is a cinema of minorities because the people exist only in, in the condition of minority, which is why they are missing. Deleuze obser observes uh, two things here. First, the myth of a united people organized against the oppressor or the organizer, uh, the, the, sorry, colonizer. Um, the ways in which power operates on colonial consciousness makes the struggle not for a reversal of power relation, but for a production of new subjectivity through continuous resistance. It is not sufficient to form a collective identity of the people in opposition to the enemy. Second, Deleuze speaks about uh, of the limitations of tyrannic unity that subjects different people to an abstract ideal rather than making them subjects themselves. Recognizing the absence of people is to acknowledge the limits of a to totalizing principle under which the people used to be united. What then could be done about the problem of change that he speaks of? Deleuze's answer is the invention of a people. Drawing on Kafka and the Quebecois filmmaker Pierre uh, Peru, he defines the condition under which post-colonial subjectivity is produced as impossibility. The impossibility of writing in the dominant language and the impossibility of living under domination. Deleuze writes, um, 
Quote, it is as if modern political cinema were no longer constituted on the basis of a possibility of evolution or re revolution, like the cl uh, classical cinema, but on impossibilities in the style of Kafka, the, uh, the intolerable. Kafka invented what Deleuze calls a revolutionary writing that develops a minor utilization of the major language and his use of the German of Prague intermixed with Czech and Yiddish by revealing the very poverty of the language of the colonized and by opposing the oppressed quality of the major language to its oppressive quality. As uh, Peru imagines a new people through crisis, depicting the colonized person who comes up against an impasse in every direction, the invention of a people concerns not the mix of a past people, but, quote, storytelling of the people to come. Deleuze writes, the, mom the moment the master or the colonizer proclaims there have never been people here, the missing people are a becoming, they invent themselves in shanty towns, camps, and, or in ghettos in new conditions of struggle. The strength of Deleuze's concept of uh, people to come lies in the affirmation of a, uh, absence and impossibility that define the condition of the people most, uh, more accurately. If Fanon emphasized the failure of recognition in the production of racialized subjects, Deleuze is more interested in uh, demonstrating how to express the very impossibility of living under domination without being subjected to the dominant logic and language. Um, here, the condition of resistance does not lie in the recognition from or the assimilation with the oppressor, but in inventing a people that is not yet in the present. Um, concluding section. People of color reconsidered. Um, resistance uh, and refusal. Deleuze's uh, conceptualization of colonial subjectivity as a people to come provides insights into the formation of racialized subjects. It reveals the temporal structure of as absence in terms of not yet or to come. Um, and it acknowledges crisis as a condition for the new forms of struggle. What is shared across different peoples of color is the absence, the lack of the right to belong uh, in the present. Understood in terms of um, absence, the notion of people in people of color is a name for numerous peoples that are unnameable in the dominant language of the present that is uh, centered on white normativity. The struggle of people of color is that of asserting their right to fully belong in the present rather than making a space in the white, uh, white space. Defined in this way, the notion of people of color would resist racial ascription and refuse white identification. Perhaps a distinction between two concepts of people would be helpful. The, the people of color, as opposed to a people, <coughs> could remain reactionary defined in opposition to and understood in proximity to whiteness in reproducing the logic of white dom domination within their own community. People of color understood as a people, a people to yet to come, concerns an invention of new forms of subjectivity based on self-determination of the peoples themselves. It um, reframes the question of racialization as a, a productive condition of any process of subjective formation rather than the one that concerns only non-white people. These two concepts of people are related to two kinds of refusal. Understanding the notion of people of, of color as people to come takes a conscious refusal uh, of the present racial identification. It puts one in identity crisis as well as a battle with oneself. It reject, rejects a hasty integration, in, uh, integration or recognition through white ident identified assimilation. It embraces the past, but it rejects its projection onto the present. It is crucial to distinguish this form of refusal from a denial, a, repu a repudiation of racial identity or deracialization as a form of reluctance to the negative implications of the people of color. 
the attempt to de-racialize combines uh, well with the assimilationist ideology. Assimilation is a search for recognition on uh, the white terms, it is a strategy to feel belong to the present that is condemned to fail. This form of refusal leads to a deeper subordination as well as a perpetuation of racist ideology. Um, there is no doubt that the notion people of color uh, is necessary for building coalitions among communities of color to resist white supremacy. However, the terms should be adopted with critical awareness given the externality of its organizing principle. And speaking through their absence, a people of color invents itself in the now as a people to come by refusing both the colonial past that they are identified with and the white future ascribed to the existing people of color. As Martino and Riske uh, write, the freedom realized through refusal is the freedom to imagine and create an elsewhere in the here, a, pre a present future beyond the imaginative and territorial bounds of colonialism. Thank you. We have time for a question and answer. Thanks for this paper, Paul. It was really interesting. Um, and I wonder, I'm still trying to kind of take in what you're saying. And so one thing I'm a little bit stuck on, you brought up Jared Sexton's work towards the beginning. And I'm just wondering if you thought through some of the implications of like an Afro-pessimist view, that kind of like ontological view of the, the like negation of blackness in relationship to the idea of a people to come, or it's sort of the ontological project that you're talking about. Um, I just wondered if you've kind of struggled with that aspect of his work, mm -hmm. or how that might impact what you're saying about the sort of like absent presence. Mm -hmm. Um, right, I think there's there's a relation, although I'm, I'm new to this uh, point of view of uh, Afro-pessimism and uh, success work, uh, this, this article was the only, only one that I read, uh, The People of Color Blindness. But, okay. um, but I think in, in terms of refusal, right, and uh, instead yeah. of looking for recognition, um, but, um, but sort of cutting the tie at all, right, and, right. and when uh, understanding one's racialized body in reference to whiteness and uh, cutting that tie at all, uh, that sort of pessimism, I think, is related to what I am trying to um, articulate here. This lecture seems uh, extremely American. Uh, Pardon me? This lecture seems extremely American, <laughs> but you're definitely here. Um, what I wanted to say is, there seems to be like a political outlets uh, other than uh, becoming white. Because I was, I was actually in Hanoi, right? And when Ho Chi Minh was growing up, he was, uh, there, uh, Vietnam was being colonized by the French colonization. And uh, what he did to actually uh, overthrow the colonization was like, you know, he spent time in Europe and a lot of time in France. And he, he shifted, perhaps, you know, at first, uh, the resistance was geared towards just straight French people. But then somehow he organized the political mm -hmm. revolution yeah. from other countries. Like when he went to France, with the country that was actually uh, doing colonization, and he met with like the Communist Party of mm -hmm. France and whatever political parties were at that time, and mm -hmm. kind of shifted towards the working class, you know. So even the working class French that were colonizing France mm -hmm. themselves, uh, Vietnam themselves. He was able to do a revolution uh, mm -hmm. that way. Do you see what I'm saying? Is it, is it like kind of like a, there's like a different outlet of uh, you know overthrowing the oppression? <laughs> right. Uh, so I think if I understood correctly, what you're saying is that the um, perhaps the master's tools can be useful also to dismantle <laughs> this oppression. Um, the colonizers' uh, framework can also um, be, be led to the liberation 
yeah. of the colonizers. That, you know, Which just shift is kind of like shifting away the, the dominance into a different type of, uh, I wouldn't say like a different type of dominance, but it's just from like internally uh, working with the French political sphere in France, mm -hmm. you know, with the working class, you know, like what is the working class in France doing? Mm -hmm. Why are we supporting the colonization of Vietnam? Mm -hmm. You know, and Ho Chi Minh was the first communist in Vietnam, you know, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, what I can see, I think the coalition can be formed in, in different routes, right? What, that's one thing that you're, I think, um, mentioning here. But also, um, what I see more in there is that, um, ironically, the liberation of the colonized or the revolution uh, or the framework that um, provided for that revolution is also from the West, right? The colonizers. Yeah. And that's very um, common in, in colonized countries because it's, um, right, there's um, imperialism, capitalism, and these, um, the things that the, pe the people have to resist um, are Western values. So the means to resist that um, power has to be also imported imported from the colonizers. Um, so that's sort of the irony of the whole discourse, right, as a decolonization. The language itself is Western, and the discourse itself cannot be free from that um, um, colonization, uh, I mean, yeah. The discourse itself cannot be free, free from that language of the uh, the dominant language. So I think that's um, also that was also the case in Korea when um, the military regime was um, overturned. That was also by the Marxist theoretical framework. So um, it's it's a different layers of of theoretical colonization in a way um, that lead to the revolution and the liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but I think my question in a way is, is related to this issue of the, um, the Western character of the, of the language or mm -hmm. something like that. But um, I, I've been reading The Last Days of the Incas and it's a fascinating book, but it's also terrible because I keep rooting for the Incas, and I want them to beat the Spaniards definitively, you know? and it's not going to happen. But, um, but, but this the the way that it's been framed in your paper in terms of reclaiming the power of self determination, um, I was thinking about that in relation to you know, what I've been reading. This, this horrible tale of, of you know, conquest and colonization. And, uh, it seems to me that that language would be unintelligible. Uh, I mean, the whole Inca universe is coming apart. So what the it's not a problem of denied power of self determination. It's mm -hmm. the, the whole uh, the whole realm of meanness. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's if there's a way to <coughs> articulate the problem of white normativity or uh, racialization, not in such a way that we're not relying upon something like subjectivity in the sense of the power of self determination, mm -hmm. but it could be understood in some other way. And I don't know what that other way would be, but it would be a different uh, different framing. Right, because the, the very idea of, of constructing subjectivity is also um, perhaps um, 
first the Western right, mm -hmm. language, and um, it already sets the subject subjectivity in opposition, uh, sets sets itself up against whatever is not right. Right. So um, I think that's um, that's a that's a great point to to think about. I think the one of the reasons why Deleuze turns to aesthetics is is um, related to this because um, it's depicting uh, fragmented um, fragmented subjectivity, if we can still call it, uh, or the the very lack of it um, is when especially when it la lacks the language and when he when Deleuze Deleuze looks for this possibility of um, a different form of resistance that is not subsumed right under the dominant language. It, he, I think, he turns to the aesthetic to possibilities um, like Kafka's writing or Pierre Perrault's, um films, where people just sit there and not doing anything <laughs> in his films. In many of his films. Um, there's this idleness of, of um, people and um, feel feel sort of like doesn't occupy any sort of time. Um, so, or showing a pure duration of time without any sort of actions. So, um, and there's also the idea of fatigue, of not be, being able to do any, uh, anything positive. So, um, and that's something that I, I didn't think about, but I think that's a valid uh, point. But, uh, I mean, just to follow up then, <coughs> is this like aesthetic move mm -hmm. and a meditation on pure duration or, or what have you, is this, um, is, is it for the sake of opening up some alternative discourse or way of articulating resistance? Or? Um, I don't know if I would call it discourse, but certainly a different, for the sake of creating different possibilities of resistance and um, claim their presence in different ways other than um, the dominant language of discourse. Uh, thank you for your talk, Warren. I really appreciate it a lot, and it's given me a lot to think about, especially in relationship to the sort of maybe fraught nature of the term people of color as it circulates within more activist or social justice kind of circles. And I think, you know, one, I have a lot of questions, um, <laughs> but one, one question that I'm really curious about is in terms of your use of Deleuze. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, for a project like this, I think that Deleuze is, you know, like a fantastic resource. Um, but I wonder if the problem of race um, and the issue of race, and in order to address that, maybe demand some pressure being put on Deleuze, mm -hmm. right? And I think that yeah. part of my, in, in hearing you talk, you know, in terms of the notion of it, the invention of a people and that it can't draw upon the myth of a past people and that the people are not present given the configurations of, um, as you put uh, in your um, <coughs> use in terms of race and white normativity, privilege, supremacy. Um, I'm sort of, this is where I'm, I get drawn to the work of like the anthropologist Elizabeth Povinelli and the work of Mark Rifkin in his book Beyond Settler Time. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I'm drawn to this work is that, well, they insist that people were already there, mm -hmm. you know, just not on terms that would be recognized through like the colonial right. encounter. And maybe it's the very paradigm of coloniality that makes the people, you know, absent, absent. in some way, right? And that calling upon the past people is not just a myth. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are certainly problems around um, the way, the, like around the issue of the colonial encounter and how pe uh, peoples understand themselves um, retrospectively. Like Ashil mm -hmm. Mbembe talks about this in on the post colony, where he says like a certain political elite mm -hmm. after decolonization then reinterprets um, histories to its own advantage, right? But 
you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in the idea that, well, what, what if the people's, you know, are not missing, but mm -hmm. they're, they've been enduring, mm -hmm. right? And that the question is less one of the sort of Deleuzian becoming and more of in terms of, you know, like indigenous refusal, of, as we've been talking about in the book group, um, in terms of like the uninterrupted nature of sovereignty mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the reason why I want to bring this up, and finally, is that um, I think towards the end of your presentation, you say that part of the strategic value in the term people of color is to assert fully belonging in the present. Mm -hmm. And what I'm interested in are the ways in which, you know, I think there's an opportunity and an opening in your work to put pressure on Deleuze to say, well, what present are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Because Rifkin, in his in Beyond Settler Time, he goes through this sort of like Einsteinian, quasi-Deleuzean notion mm -hmm. of time where there's not like, where where there's not just like modernity and peoples have been excluded, but no, indigenous peoples have just been in a different time, mm -hmm. right? And that the idea is not one of becoming, but it's one of continuity and built into continuity is, you know, some elasticity, some transformation, some internal dissonance and whatnot mm -hmm. um, that tends to be overlooked through more colonialist paradigms of mm -hmm. peoples and time. Right, right, yeah. Um, that's very sharp. I think. I, I had a um, ontological sort of assumption that that we're talking about one temporality, right? That we are all here, but some some people are are not actually here <laughs> and in the present. But um, your um, comment about people being already there, right? That's um, really interesting, um, and it is. It is very true that the absence that I'm talking about here is an absence from a certain point of view, mm -hmm. uh, um, colonial colonizers' perspective. They are absent, um, but I think I wanted to uh, frame the question in terms of absence because um, I wanted to address the actual struggles of. The, the people of color and the people who have to deal with their colon, um, colonial past, colonial mm -hmm. history, and meaning that they um, they are um, they have already internalized the the, col the colonizers' values and they live in the colonizers' world and. Um, there, I think it's more powerful to um, emphasize their absence despite their actual presence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think this is ultimately uh, the battle with oneself, right? The liberation ultimately is how the, the colonized fights against this desire to become like the colonizer or desire to become to, to be included in the colonize, mm -hmm. colonizer world or mm -hmm. white world however you put it mm -hmm. so I think that to act, actually address that the, that struggle um, that people have to go through um, I thought the absence would would uh, describe that better um, mm -hmm. And, and that's helpful because I think one of the things I appreciated at the beginning of your talk was your sensitivity to, well, for whom and for whom and for what should the term people of color be deployed? And I think maybe, you know, based on your clarification, um, you know, I think that's helpful in terms of situating. Mm -hmm. What you're doing with the critique, because I think, like with Sarah's, with Sarah's point, you know, the Afro pessimists they argue that well, racial slavery instituted a fundamental breach in the world, and there's nothing that can be done to recuperate blackness into the world, no matter how radical a change the world undergoes. And I think that, you know, you're doing really important work in terms of pushing away from that angle. And I, but I think that, um, you know, I'm wondering if, because for them. You know, they too want to get away from, I think, the notion of people of color. They want to emphasize blackness. And by emphasizing blackness, that generates a certain politics. Right. Because their idea is that, well, you know, 
we don't have to worry about the temptation to assimilate because well we never can no assimilate right. there's right. no possibility of doing so right. and so I think you clarifying this issue especially and I think that this was helpful and maybe um, bringing it through the rest of the paper might be good as well like focusing it on Asian Americans and the notion of model minority right. um, I think that is a particularly fruitful Mm -hmm. avenue for the strategic importance as, of as an in-between state, like you can assimilate to an extent. Right. right. And also, it's, you can never be successful, successfully become white. Right. I mean, in some ways, it's like we're both not present, but too present. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, too present. Yeah. It's a invisibility at the same time, hyper-visibility. Hyper mm -hmm. Mike, did you have a it sort of follows up on Chaz, actually. Uh, so maybe the answer will just uh, be an elaboration of what you're talking about. Um, but I'm, as you probably not surprised to hear, my question is on the ontology, mm -hmm. um, especially as a Bergsonian, right? So I okay. hear in your resistance to the current um, notions of people of color, there's probably externalities, right? So, um, and I heard in your response to the first question, a kind of resistance to this maybe um, the only way of kind of preserving the presence of the past in the present, right? That the, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the possibilities that unfold, um, you know, if we consider them as being the possibilities that are contained within the kind of hegemonic languages that we've inherited, that just repeats the hegemony, right? right? So on the Bergsonian lens, you could say, well, then what we need is the present as that which is not, right? Because the present is always kind of pushing toward this new future. Right. So I'm wondering why it's a people and not a people's. Mm -hmm. yet to come um, in that respect. Right, so um, I think it, it can be peoples. <laughs> uh, Deleuze says the infinity of peoples and there are people who shouldn't be created, invented, right? I think we know some people who shouldn't be really recognized. <laughs> uh, um, so I think it's uh, just the, the emphasis I think is on a people rather than the people, the people who never existed before. So, uh, or the people who cannot be captured by um, the familiar language that we're using. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it means that there is only one people to come, but um, it can be many others. Um, and Bergsonian um, reference, uh, reference to Bergson you mentioned, uh, is important actually. I didn't talk about it here in the paper, but um, Deleuze says that the invention of people to come is through memory. So, uh, the memory in, in the Bergsonian sense, right? <laughs> the memory of not what, what has happened before, but memory of how to um, recreate the past. Right, and how to repeat the past uh, in a different manner in the present. So uh, there's that Bergsonian uh, idea. He Deleuze also uses the idea of fabulation that uh, Deleuze, uh, that Bergson uses. How invention of a people is a storytelling, but uh, it's it's not a storytelling of uh, of a as a private matter because for Deleuze. Being a minority means that means uh, three things: creating, uh, using the language in a different way, in a creative way, speaking like a stranger in your own mother tongue, and whatever you say is political. Right? Everything becomes immediately political, and third, everything becomes um, becomes collective. So these three are what he defines as minority, uh, and. So there's, there's that Bergsonian uh, ontology and theory of time that's in, the, in play um, in the background. I think there was... I just, I, on the very first section, yeah, mm -hmm. you were, um, the, the idea was that there's this, uh, via white normativity, there's a kind of an establishment of uh, a hierarchy of things that are more or less proximate to white. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the, the idea is that all of this has also got a negative definition for whiteness. And, and it's also the case that 
<clears throat> you were taking a kind of <clears throat> well, particular view from the United States. Mm -hmm. And so the thought I was thinking of mm -hmm. listening to the brutality of this is, couldn't we just generalize it, right? Because there's nothing here about that's all that whitey. In terms of, I mean, we could take the Han and Tibet, Japanese and Korea, Turks and Kurds, Russians and Uzbeks, the Vietnamese and the Hmong, mm -hmm. the Mexicans and the indigenous in Central America. Mm -hmm. Being assholes is a general feature of humanity. <laughs> <clears throat> and it seems like this relationship that you're describing is a kind of relationship that we see over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. If we concentrate on the American experience, then mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's going to come out with a particular story mm -hmm. about the notion of white privilege mm -hmm. and people of color, mm -hmm. but in a way that also seems to diminish the story you're telling because mm -hmm. it becomes parochial. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not reflecting this broader feature of the way in which human beings interact with each other mm -hmm. and, and isolate and marginalize each other. So I was just, in thinking about this, I was, that's what I was wondering, is there any reason that it has to be particularly about mm -hmm. the white uh, when we think about kind of the relationships of ethnic groups across the, the world? Uh, I said I, I said that I, I limit my dis discussion to the racial discourse in the United, United States because there's a particular use of the term people of color in the United States, um, and people of color um, or being colored means something very different. For example, in South Africa, right? Right. So, well, no. And, and what I was thinking though is, of course, your the distinctions you're drawing. Mm -hmm. seem to be those that could be, right, it's clearly people of color is going to mean something different if I'm in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. But the divides that you're pushing on mm -hmm. seem to be more, seem to be broader kinds of divisions that reflect something about human psychology mm -hmm. as we walk across the planet, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to see, say, marginalized groups, whether it's under the, the category of people of color, mm -hmm. right, are going to have similar sorts of experiences given whatever the majority of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so it, 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 this isn't a negative criticism at all. Right, right. It's I, rather that perhaps there's a story here that's far broader mm -hmm. in its potential telling. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I'm a little hesitant though. Uh, I, I appreciate that you're, you see this framework uh, as being powerful enough to expand <laughs> beyond, but I think I'm a little hesitant still because uh, there's historical specificities of colonization in one country and different in, in another. And uh, in United States and uh, also in, in, um, the, in North America, when we talk about people of color, right, um, are we talking about also indigenous peoples? Then their connection with the land is different. Their, their, their experience of the colonizer is different from, uh, for example, an Asian American who came from a different land, but still uh, conform to, ha having to conform to the white world, right? So there's a different dynamic that um, is worth mentioning that I am I'm a little hesitant to, um, and, it's, and also when we talk about different racial dynamics in different countries, uh, or majority minority, um, it's really not a number. Of, it's really not a, a question of numbers, who is min minority and who is majority, but it's about power, right? So, um, I wonder if it could be expanded to uh, or applied to other contexts. Well, I, clearly, it would be a problem in, in right, expansion. I mean, I, there's some cases though that. Maybe maybe the worth considering is the Vietnamese historical relationship with the Hmong. They colonized the Hmong. They treated the Hmong like shit the entire time they've been there. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which Mexicans treat the indigenous populations in Central America is very much the way we see the treatment of indigenous populations mm -hmm. in North America. Um, and that How is that not a project that white guys? Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I don't. It's at least. This is actually, I guess the way to say it is that's actually the kind of question that I want, is that it's just as a way of seeing that let's not target it at a particular place in time, but to see that we see a relationship occurring over and over again. But can't um, we extrapolate that the colonial project from the 15th century to the present is uh, the European project of colonialism is a project of whiteness? Um, 
whether it's the uh, the British in India or South Africa or uh, the Americas or but do we or miss something by not recognizing that the Han have engaged in exactly the same project in Tibet and Mongol? And to what degree is that a function of uh, their replicating the Westphalian state ideological constructs? It's not, and that's precisely the question that I'm raising. And so I would. And you're, you're, you're missing something by concentrating on a particular culture and thinking that that culture is the full explanation of this project, rather than seeing that human beings replicate this behavior historically again and again and again. But I think Lauren's dealing with a very specific problem. She's, her res burden of responsibility is not to solve human assholeness. <laughs> you know, it's a very specific political problem in a very specific debate. Yes, there are oversights to it. No one's going to write a 20-volume series to solve human psychology, and I don't think that's a fair burden. You know, and I think there's a lot that of... that as a criticism, it was not issued as a criticism. Well, I don't think it's... I'm not reading I it as a criticism. I'm, I'm, as a I'm not... She has I'm not... I don't view it as a criticism. I view it as besides the point that actually detracts from but the I immense value of this project. So. I'll enjoy your work. That was awesome. This was Thank you. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's all thank our speaker. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have lots of refreshments out in the hallway. We welcome you all to stay a little bit and uh, grab something to eat and drink that we can keep the conversation up here. And if you haven't signed in, so please sign in with one of the sign-up sheets. I'm pessimistic about the ink. I'm looking for the last battle of that. Oh.